Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Samantha Klingler, and I am the director of the Student Development and Success Center. Still not on? They're having some issues hearing. I think they said it, it, it doesn't sound like more in the auditorium. It's for the, the recording, so you just have to project. Okay. So it sounds like that uh, I just need to speak a little bit louder here in the auditorium. So um, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. My name is Samantha Klingler. I am the director of the Student Development and Success Center here on campus. Um, first thing that we wanted to do was uh, we wanted to recognize that the topic that we're about to discuss might be um, a bit triggering or difficult for especially some of our students. And so um, please know that Ron Pettigrew has a list um, of local campus and community resources um, in the back. We also have Jake Mitchell, who is one of our counseling center um, uh, counselors. He is available. Everybody wave at Jake back there. If you would like to speak um, to him, he will be around. Please do so. We have a lot of great resources on our campus for um, counseling, including our counseling center, our WIU um, psychology clinic, and multiple other offices across campus that can support our students. Um, so one last thing before I uh, hand it off, I just wanted to say thank you um, to Jeremy Robinette, who has really done a lot of great work in trying to um, get this panel together and uh, make sure that we have some really great faculty uh, here today to speak with us. And so without further ado, I will um, pass the microphone to um, our panel moderator, Dr. Tim Roberts. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tim Roberts, a history professor here at Western. Can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, welcome again to this public discussion of the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, we have an in-person audience here in Western's Sandberg Theater, and we have an audience joining online on Western's YouTube channel. Uh, there is going to be a time soon for questions and discussion of them uh, from the community. If you are joining uh, online, you may still submit questions via a link which is indicated in an announcement on Western's online calendar uh, for today, if you, if you don't quite have that, that Zoom link. Of course, if you're in the Sandberg Theater, uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions also. One housekeeping note, uh, because this is a uh, university, students in Professor Rick Hardy's classes here should register their attendance with Professor Keith Bockelman, who is waving there. Yeah, great. Uh, so I am joined here uh, by three distinguished Western professors who will speak about the Ukrainian crisis based on their expertise. Dr. Greg Baldi is a political scientist with a specialty in European politics. Uh, Dr. Betsy Parabo is a scholar of religion who has published work on the Russian Orthodox Church. And Dr. Richard Philippink, my colleague in the history department teaches and writes about U.S. foreign relations, particularly in the era of the Cold War. Uh, I wish to say that while we are experts in our fields, we certainly don't have all the answers on this troubling issue. This is an unforeseen time of uncertainty and for many of us, perhaps some fears. All of us, all of us in this panel share with everyone here the humble hope that this tragedy in Ukraine will end very soon. 
and that peacemakers will rise up in Russia and bring that country to its senses. To that end, an announcement of a community event, the Interfaith Alliance of Macomb is planning a community pray, per, pray for peace vigil on Wednesday, April 6th, Wednesday, April 6th, 6.30 to 7.30 in the evening at Chandler Park in Macomb. Uh, in the event of rain, it will be held at the First Presbyterian Church. The program will include prayers for war-torn people of the world in Ukraine, Russia, and elsewhere. Everyone is welcome. Meanwhile, here at Western, whether we have faculty, administrators, staff, or students, we comprise a community of learning. We believe that when we have reliable, relevant information, it helps us to push back against uncertainty and fear. As President Franklin Roosevelt said in his day, facts help us resist the urge to simply crawl into bed and to pull the covers over our heads. This exercise today in which we are joined, it is part of our habit of learning. It is doubly important, moreover, because it is an exercise and an aspect of participating in our democracy. Uh, let me then, without further ado, turn it to the first uh, speaker, Dr. Greg Baldy. All right. Uh, thank you to Tim and uh, Jeremy, everyone involved with putting uh, this event together. Um, it's very nice to be uh, back together talking about uh, issues of importance. Um, you know, here in a shared space. Um, the invasion of Ukraine by forces of the Russian Federation that began on February 24th is, I think, by any measure, uh, one of the most significant events in Europe's history since the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And the images that we've seen, armored columns, fleeing refugees, cities reduced to rubble by airstrikes, um, have shocked many. And I would say that for many of us, these were images that seemed to belong to a different time. What I'd like to do uh, in my few minutes here is talk a little bit about the history leading up to this invasion. And then uh, perhaps, you know, more as part of our um, question and answer, address some of the issues associated with why this invasion has taken place. So the first thing I want to note is that, uh, so Ukraine and Russia, for most of the past four centuries, have belonged to a common political unit, first in the Russian Empire, and then after the uh, October Revolution and the Russian Civil War in the Soviet Union. Now Ukraine gains independence uh, along with uh, 14 other uh, post-Soviet states in 1991 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And Ukraine is the second largest of the post-Soviet states uh, after Russia itself. Now, in the 1990s, Ukraine and Russia um, reach a series of um, agreements that effectively serve to recognize Ukraine's post-Soviet borders and provide a commitment to Ukraine's security. In the 2000s, however, things changed significantly. Ukraine will experience a series, uh, well, two popular uprisings. Um, and the second of these, uh, which takes place really in 2013 and 2014, is tied to a belief that Russia has um, had uh, taken over too much of a role in Ukrainian domestic politics and stopped Ukraine from its desired goal to align more with the West, right? That is to say, with the European Union 
and potentially also with NATO, NATO, the defense-led alliance, uh, the, the defense alliance led by the United States. Um, this leads to uh, ultimately uh, in 2013, this popular uprising that uh, brings about the impeachment of the pro-Russian president, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, and then also um, to uh, a um, election of a new, more pro-European president, uh, Petro Poroshenko, who himself is succeeded in 2018 by uh, another pro-Western president, uh, Voldemort Zelensky, whom uh, Americans and really people around the world have come to know over this last month. Now, Russia responds to these developments in 2014 um, by disputing uh, the impeachment of the pro-Russian Ukrainian president and quickly moving in military terms um, to annex uh, Crimea. Uh, this is less of a military uh, uh, action. Uh, but one in which uh, Russia uh, essentially annexes territory that it previously had recognized as belonging to Ukraine. This is the Crimean Peninsula. Um, and then also uh, helps to coordinate a separatist campaign uh, for uh, Russian uh, supporting um, insurgents in, and separatists in the Donbas reader, a border region of Ukraine and Russia. And fighting has been going on there for the past eight years. So. Uh, although we're talking about this war um, in terms of the invasion that began in February uh, this year, it's really a conflict that's been going on for some years. Um, now, beginning in 2021, Russia began moving large-scale, uh, began a large-scale movement of troops, armored divisions, and weapon systems to the border with Ukraine. And that culminated in the invasion that began on February 24th of this year. Now, why is this happening? Why has uh, Vladimir Putin, who has been the leader of Russia um, since 2000, right, 22 years in power now, why has he uh, chosen to make this move to invade a country that Russia had previously recognized as a sovereign state and acknowledged its borders? Well, Putin himself gave two reasons for this in a speech to the Russian people on the eve of the invasion. Um, the first was he asserted that Ukraine was not a real country, a real state, that it was eff effectively part of Russia. And he invoked history and culture, and to some people's view, uh, myths uh, to justify uh, this uh, uh, reunification, if you will, of Russians via this invasion. The second reason that he gave in uh, this speech was that Ukraine had allied itself with Russia's enemies. And here he's referring to NATO and the Western Alliance and um, it's also the European Union. In doing this, he said the goal of Ukraine and its current leadership was to weaken Russia and perhaps bring about regime change in Russia itself. Um, many people believe that Putin has, uh, was Putin watched closely the developments in the Middle East and North Africa in 2010, 2011. He saw the fate of leaders like Hosni Mubarak in Egypt who was deposed and jailed and perhaps more um, uh, uh, immediately uh, the uh, killing of Muammar Gaddafi who had been the leader of Libya for uh, almost four decades following an uprising there in 2010. So this is Russia's uh, rationale, Putin's rationale, uh, to stop this weakening and circling of Russia and in some ways to kind of reunite uh, Russians who had been uh, artificially, uh, um, in some ways, uh, separated from one another. Um, Many people obviously dispute these, this rationale by Putin, and we'll talk some more about that perhaps in the questions. But to many observers, what this is really about is the threat that Vladimir Putin and his regime see from a democratized Ukraine with the rule of law and allied to other Western democracies or to Western democracies. Um, in attacking a democratic Ukraine, he hopes not only to overthrow 
its government, but also convince other countries of the region, perhaps Belarus, Kazakhstan, Poland, and Hungary, just to name a few, that democracy is not a viable option in the long term for them. This also, to this uh, explanation, would help to explain why um, Putin and his regime work so hard to discredit democracy and weaken the solidarity of the West via actions such as intervention in the American presidential election in 2016 and activities on the part of the Russian government to uh, cause uh, dissent and division in Europe, for example, through the Brexit referendum, also in 2016. So that's the basic background here to the conflict, um, a little bit about the rationale for the conflict. Uh, lots more details, though, that I hope we can address during our Q&A period. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Baldy. Uh, I'll invite Dr. Parabo to the podium. Thanks very much. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Today, I'm going to talk about religion, nationalism, and war, and particularly the form of Christian nationalism that exists in Russia. The idea that a religious or political leader might claim that a war is divinely blessed, that God has said, go to war, I command you to go to war, I am on your side, this idea is very common in the history of Christianity. Starting only a few hundred years after Jesus is reported to have said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. And my kingdom is not of this world. We see Christians and their leaders behaving as if their own worldly kingdom is the one and only kingdom of God, that this kingdom must be defended or expanded by striking others or engaging in much more violent forms of fighting, and displaying an attitude towards their enemies that does not look anything like love. It happens under the Roman Emperor Constantine, during the Crusades, during numerous wars in the medieval and Reformation eras, on both sides of the American Civil War, as European Christians fight Native Americans and indigenous populations, and it continues to happen in the 20th and 21st centuries. So it should not be very surprising that the current leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill, a very powerful figure, both religiously and politically, has described and justified the Russian invasion of Ukraine in religious terms. In particular, he suggests that Russia is really fighting to overcome the immorality found in Ukraine to ensure the flourishing of true Christianity. He describes the invasion as a struggle that has metaphysical significance and says the conflict is caused by the West's efforts to drum up tensions between Russians and Ukrainians, who are brothers in what he calls the Russian world. Professor Scott Kenworthy, who's a Russian historian at Miami University, says that the war in Ukraine is just the latest chapter in a long, tangled relationship between the Kremlin and the Russian Orthodox Church. The Kremlin here referring to the Russian state through the early 20th century, then the USSR, and then finally the Russian nation that exists today. Kenworthy notes that Patriarch Kirill's support for the invasion of Ukraine has led critics to conclude that the Orthodox leadership has become little more than an arm of the state. However, he says the history reflects a more complicated story. So there are many religious aspects to this war. I want to focus on two today. First, this concept of the Russian world, or Ruski Mir. And second, the idea in Russian history of a Christ-loving military. 
In a recent article, Yaroslav Skira, a professor at the University of Toronto, effectively sums up how Patriarch Kirill and Vladimir Putin have both drawn on a concept with a long history within the Russian church. Skira writes, the Russian world civilizational mythology holds that there exists a grand Russian civilization based on a spiritual unity between Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians. This Russian world, Ruski Mir, is a society of traditional values and is cast in opposition to a perceived decadent West. It is an ideology based on historical revisionism since the complex and distinct histories of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia are glossed over. Another scholar mentions that the description of Ukrainians as either part of the Russian nation or brothers to Russians is justified by citing a common origin which is described in terms of a common baptismal font, F-O-N-T, where people would be baptized. This refers to the point in the 10th century when the Eastern Slavs accepted Christianity as part of what was then called Kievan Rus. Populations of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians evolves as descendants of the Rus in different parts of Eastern Europe and with different cultural influences. But later, the Russian states gained supremacy over what today is Ukraine and Belarus. Skira mentions that Putin, who also, as was mentioned before, called the Ukrainian state an artificial creation, very much promotes this ideology and that Patriarch Kirill continues to uphold the Russian world mythology in his statements about the war in Ukraine, many of which you can find on the Russian Patriarch website. Many Orthodox scholars and Orthodox religious leaders have called this idea of the Ruski Mir a heresy. And a recent statement that's been now signed by about 1,200 scholars and leaders say, in part, we condemn as non-Orthodox, capital O, for Russian Orthodoxy or Eastern Orthodoxy, any teaching that seeks to replace the kingdom of God with a kingdom of this world, be that Holy Rus, Byzantium, or any other earthly kingdom. It says we reject all forms of government that deify the state, turn the state into a god, and also, we reject any teaching that attributes divine establishment or authority, special sacredness or purity to any single local, national, or ethnic identity, or characterizes any particular culture as special or divinely ordained, whether Greek, Romanian, Russian, Ukrainian, or any other. And continues, we cannot know peace until we love our enemies, the making of war is the ultimate failure of Christ's law of love. I want to turn now, just briefly, to another concept related to religion and war in Russia, that of the Christ-loving military. During the last major war of the pre-revolutionary period, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, the Orthodox Church motivated and honored the military within its liturgy, use of icons, and veneration of saints. In a well-worn phrase, the church praised those who laid down their life for the faith and the homeland. The czar was seen as a holy authority who could declare war on behalf of Christian state, and this in turn meant that Russian soldiers were obliged to fight as part of what was called the Christ-loving military, a force characterized by both justice and holiness. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, some thinkers began to revisit this concept of the Christ-loving military. A Russian military institute published an anthology of Russian language works of this topic in 1997, and the concluding essay advocates a renaissance for the Christ-loving uh, military. The author says that the defense of the homeland is considered a holy duty and cites a prayer book for Orthodox warriors from 1915 that states, the one who kills an enemy in war does not sin, because through war we protect our faith, sovereign, and homeland. He adds that the Christ-loving military is perfect, its members united by their religious worldview and their love of their homeland. In 2016, Patriarch Kirill expressed a slightly different version of support for this concept 
talking about how in World War II, Russia, at that point the USSR, had a Christ-loving military and was fighting what he called a holy war. He continued, and this is why one may boldly call our military, the Russian military, Christ-loving. We fight for justice, for homeland, for our land, and for the people against a treacherous and cruel enemy. I haven't yet encountered any references in this war to the concept of the Christ-loving military, but this background understanding of the relationship between Christianity and the military may be important in the coming days and weeks as we look at how Russian religious and political leaders connect ideas of church, state, and war. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much, Dr. Parabo. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Richard Philippink for the American perspective on this topic. Well, the, the historical perspective at any rate. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind about what's going on in the Ukraine today is that Vladimir Putin considered the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest historical tragedy of the 20th century. And he has made no bones about it over the last two decades of his rule that he intended fully to restore the Soviet Union to its past glories. And if that meant taking away the sovereignty of the states that replaced the Soviet Union, that was perfectly fine with him. He has been trafficking in the mythology of a, an unreal Ukraine state almost from the beginning of his, I'll air quote it, term in office in 2000. In a very real sense though, this is a bit of continuity with the originator of this idea in the 20th century, Joseph Stalin. In a very real sense, Vladimir Putin is sort of the dollar store version of Joseph Stalin. Stalin what formulated his views on the Ukraine thanks to, in part to his own failures. During the latter stages of World War I, as the Russian army collapsed, as the Bolsheviks began to seize power in what was then Russia, the Ukrainians, along with the Finns, along with the Latvians and Lithuanians and Estonians, began to declare independence. The Red Army sought to curtail that independence and succeeded in doing so in 1918. However, after the signature of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the Germans and Austro-Hungarians drove the Red Army out of Ukraine and allowed Ukraine to once again obtain its independence. Joseph Stalin was the political commissar who accompanied that Red Army that was defeated by the Germans and Austro-Hungarians and was the political commissar who accompanied the Red Army that reconquered the Ukraine by 1920 and forced the Ukraine to uh, sign up with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Thus, Stalin had a very long-term hatred of the Ukraine that he indulged himself in during his period of rule over the Soviet Union. Stalin imposed a man-made famine in the Ukraine in the early 1930s, uh, known as the Holodomor, killing just shy of four million Ukrainians in a process um, deliberately undertaken by the Soviet government. In order to force collectivization on the Ukraine, Stalin sent his cadres out into the backcountry, out among the peasants and farmers, and took not only the food from the fields, but also their livestock and their seeds literally starving to death four million people. In the aftermath of this horror, Stalin followed up by declaring that the Ukraine was a myth and barred the teaching of Ukrainian history, of Ukrainian language, of Ukrainian folk songs, of speaking, of referring to the Ukrainian nation that had been created in 1920 and banned speaking about the famine that he had created. Putin has followed in this same playbook almost nine decades later, attempting to eliminate the Ukraine and portray the Ukraine as unreal, as, as just another part of Russia. It was as false now as it was then. Unfortunately for the Ukrainians, their location is, um, how can we say this in a, in a in a global world is the key to their problems. That between, being between Russia and Western Europe, they are 
naturally looking both ways. In the aftermath of the, of the failure of the Soviet Union, Ukraine has oscillated between governments that have been pro-Russian and pro-West. The pro-Western governments have produced greater ties to the Western powers, attempts to join the European Union, and most recently attempts to join NATO that have triggered, to use the term, Vladimir Putin to behave as a traditional Russian autocrat, or if you like, as Stalin light. Putin will, will never and has never gotten over the Cold War. As a KGB agent in Dresden during the collapse of communism in Europe, Putin was an eyewitness to the tragedy of the failure of communism. His attempts to destroy the Ukraine and his attempts to brutalize the Ukraine in the process are not surprising at all. It is part and parcel with the behavior of the communist government that, that ruled in the Soviet Union. And unlike Stalin, who played a long game with the Ukraine, Putin is very much a 21st century autocrat who seeks a quick and easy solution to problems in the most brutal manner possible, if necessary. For the United States, our relationship with the Ukraine is in large part governed by the conflicting goals of tr at least in the 1990s, of trying to bring the Russians into the 20th century, outside of the Soviet Union. As well as to try and transition the post-Soviet governments of these emerging nations into, if not democracy, at least into, well, at least into acceptable behaviors, albeit uh, not always successfully. The Americans have unfortunately been somewhat distracted by their own problems out in the post-Cold War era as the Americans sought to facilitate the transition of the Russians into the global economy. Remember, historically speaking, during the 1930s and 40s, the Soviet Union deliberately did not participate in the global economy, did not joined the World Bank, did not join the International Monetary Fund, which made the post-Cold War transition to a global Russia that much more difficult. And it made it that much harder for the United States and the Western powers to treat the Russians as they would another emerging nation. Unfortunately, the side effect of this treatment was the rise of Vladimir Putin and the situation in which we now find ourselves. Now, I know that the, the focus today is going to be on questions both from the in-person audience and from online, so I will stop here and turn the floor over to Dr. Roberts and allow you to take advantage of the expertise of our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philippink. And uh, yeah, that was, those are really, uh, uh, a range of perspectives from, you can see the different disciplines on display as well here on this panel um, from the different uh, speakers. I'll let you uh, uh, get your thoughts together. If, you, if anybody would like to online again, uh, offer a question online through the Zoom link uh, that Dr. Robinette is monitoring. There's, we also have a chance for people to uh, raise your hand and ask a question, which I'll repeat so everybody can hear it, uh, to the panel. Let me get started, though. I wanted to kind of uh, burrow into uh, Mr. Putin a little bit, based on the, the comments we've heard. Um, I did my own survey of adjectives used to describe uh, Vladimir Putin of late, and very common to hear, to read words like unhinged, unstable, um, psychotic, Irrational. Uh, that's not the perspective, I would say, of, of, the, of the panel, uh, I, I, I gather. So I wanted to ask if you believe, uh, any of you can comment on whether you think that Vladimir Putin is more kind of Machiavellian and kind of uses any kind of rhetoric or any kind of device to get his way, anything goes entirely ruthless, or is he at some level 
kind of ideological and compelled to do things because he truly believes, for example, he shares the Orthodox Church's leadership's belief, uh, assertion, as Dr. Perabo says, as I hear her, that the Ukrainians and the Russians are truly Christian brothers and sisters. So what, what do you think about uh, perhaps an initial focus, again, on, on, on President Putin's, if you can do it, your, his mindset, and uh, what his end game is here at this point? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to what Putin really thinks or really believes. I can, I can really only tell you what, how, he's, how he's acted um, historically in relation, I mean, whether he really is a strong orthodox believer, whether he really buys into this idea of uh, the Russian world, I think that's entirely possible. Um, what I do know is that he is very aware of how to exploit anyone who has sort of sincere orthodox proclivities, sensitivities, whatever, that, you know, if it, he, he's, I, I found um, from 2017, there was this wonderful picture where he went to speak at a, um, a church conference. And, and by the way, if you don't know, Russian orthodoxy is, orthodoxy is kind of complex, but the Russian Orthodox patriarch has something on the level of the, the Pope in terms of religious authority for Orthodox believers. So there was a conference at um, a religious institution and there was a room that's probably like, you know, three times the, the height of this one. And there's this huge arc with all of the 12 apostles. And there's a picture of Putin and the patriarch, Kirill, standing next to each other. And it's very striking. I mean, it's very much like he's trying to put himself into that narrative. Now, whether he believes in that narrative, I, I just, I can't say. It doesn't seem unlikely, but I also just don't have that kind of insight, so. Well, one of the, one of the realities, to, to not belabor this point, is that Putin is a career KGB officer before coming into to this position. And so the weaponizing of history and disinformation is sort of standard operating procedures for Putin and his ilk. And so this, this, this deliberate attempt to sow this kind of confusion and to, to force people to question what he actually believes and what he actually thinks is part and parcel of, of behavior you know, fomented by the KGB. It's one of the weaknesses that the Americans had during the Cold War as to whether or not they could figure out what, this, what the Soviets were really thinking or really intended to do, and that hasn't really much changed. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that, you know, I think um, we can see Putin as um, sort of not a, an either-or proposition here in a sense that he, uh, uh, he, he may be a true believer, right, in these uh, views about uh, Russian history and nationalism, but he may also at the same time be instrumentalizing, if you will, those um, perspectives for sort of short-term or even longer-term political objectives. And, um, you know, in that sense, um, you know, somebody like uh, Slobodan Milosevic comes to mind from uh, Serbia, the former leader uh, of the Serbian Republic during the Yugoslav civil wars. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think uh, all of this mix, you know, Putinology uh, is, uh, is, has become a, a sort of industry of its own. Uh, very difficult to say. I mean, one thing that is uh, interesting and perhaps different, maybe, maybe it, it makes this harder still, is that uh, un unlike Stalin or you know, most of the Soviet leaders, Putin has been re relatively accessible to, uh, to the West, to journalists. He sits down for interviews. He uh, answers questions. He, um, so he's not uh, someone who's sort of hidden behind you know, a kind of um, uh, a, a wall or a barrier like we saw during Soviet times. Um, but it's made it in some ways harder, I think, to figure Putin out, um, maybe somewhat uh, in, a, in a somewhat uh, unexpected or contradictory way. Is there a follow-up question from the audience in the theater on, on uh, a particular aspect of Mr. Putin? Yes, go ahead. Okay.
Sure. The question is about oh, sure. oh, the right. uh, religious landscape in Ukraine, particularly, and how that is relevant to perhaps reaction to uh, assertions, if we will, by the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, as much as we can predict. Go ahead. So the, the religious situation, and especially the situation relating to orthodoxy in Ukraine, is a complicated one. And I started to write it out, and then I realized I would take my entire time, you know, my entire five, eight to ten minutes describing it. But basically, what happened several years ago is that a group of Christians in Ukrainian, the, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church um, were recognized by another Orthodox institution, not the Russian Orthodox institution, by another Orthodox institution as the official Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And then there's another set of Ukrainian churches that is recognized as the official Ukrainian Orthodox Church by Kirill and the authorities in Moscow. This is a, actually a very big deal. It was a complicated issue. The U.S. weighed in recognizing this new Orthodox Church, um, which again, it doesn't describe itself as new. It just says, we're the Orthodox Church in Ukraine. But the conflict between these two groups of Ukrainian Orthodox churches, and especially the Russians' failure or, or refusal to recognize the new church and to call it sectarian and her heretical and so forth, has been a part of the conversation um, if you follow what the Patriarchate and other Russian Orthodox leaders are saying. Um, that they're saying the West has caused this problem, you recognize this group of people as Ukrainian Orthodox, and you're trying to corrupt our sacred Orthodox Church. So that's one thing. Um, there also are a number of other religious groups in, in Ukraine, as uh, Amy mentioned, um, there are Roman Catholics, there are, uh, very famously, the, the leader of Ukraine is Jewish. Um, and so there are a number, and almost every other religious group, including, I believe, all mem members of the World Council of Churches, so I'd have to check on that, except for the Moscow Patriarchate, have said, please, Kirill, please, Patriarch Kirill, come out against this war. You've got to oppose it. Um, and so that's, that's been an interesting factor as well. So a lot of different things going on, though, in, in Ukraine, just in terms of religion. Let me, uh, let me ask, let me shift gears a little bit. I wanted to, there's a question um, about the historical relationship, if any, between Ukraine and the United States. Uh, and read today that uh, President Biden has pledged to accept 100,000 refugees from Ukraine. He's now in Europe, focused on family reunification. Uh, is there any history between the United States and Ukraine, or uh, perhaps slightly different relationship, the American and the Ukrainian people? And this, I think, the context for that is as I asked my students, what could compel, justify American intervention, uh, perhaps more than is at present in the Ukrainian crisis? Well, I mean, I'll say a few things about these, uh, this issue. Um, it's not an issue I uh, have researched myself. I'll speak about it more as a Pennsylvanian than as a scholar, which is to say Pennsylvania and uh, other parts of the United States, um, Ohio, um, uh, uh, West Virginia, have uh, pockets of quite significant Ukrainian immigration, uh, experienced uh, immigration uh, in the first part of the 20th century. And so there's quite significant groups of Ukrainian Americans in uh, those regions. Um, so that's one element. And I think those ties, I mean, you see Ukrainian culture made known to Americans you know, in the same way that uh, other uh, national groups uh, have done that in the United States. There's some evidence now that some of those groups, and again, we've seen this with other groups. I'm thinking here back to the Yugoslav civil wars, Croatians and Serbians, even in this state, um, who uh, uh, took positions in those conflicts, Croatian and Serbian Americans, who took positions in those conflicts seeking to influence American policy. There's some question if um, 
you know, Ukrainian Americans may make this an issue in American domestic politics, um, you know, as, uh, well, it seems we're always in a presidential campaign uh, cycle in the U.S. now, but, uh, you know, looking to, to maybe midterm elections, presidential elections. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, Dr. Robinette, there's a question from the Zoom audience. Yes, Zach, who's in Political Science 400, would like to know, do the panelists believe there is a chance that Putin could be deposed if there is a large enough domestic opposition? So the question is, do the panelists believe that Putin could be deposed by domestic opposition of some critical mass or moment? It seems today, speaking today, incredibly unlikely without the support of the military that, that the, the only certain way uh, any sort of mass movement in, in Russia today would be able to depose Putin would be to convince the military to switch sides. That's, that's ultimately what, what saved, uh, you know, Gorbachev and Yeltsin back during the the coup in, in nineteen in nineteen ninety and it's really street protests are not necessarily going to to overthrow Putin. He's 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 too too well entrenched and too well surrounded by people whose whose lives and livelihoods are tied to his success. I I would say in general I agree with that. Um, but I'll say also that I remember very clearly the first uh, one of these panel discussions that I was involved with when I first started at WIU. It's right here, and we were talking about the uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa, the so-called Arab Spring uprisings, starting in the fall, sort of late, late fall, early winter of 2010. And at that time, the consensus was leaders like Hosni Mubarak in Egypt and Gaddafi in Libya and Ben Ali. Ben Ali, actually, he went pretty fast, but. Uh, um, that these were uh, leaders who had uh, elaborate security you know, uh, networks in their countries. They controlled the militaries. They controlled secret police. Uh, many people in the country were financially dependent on their position. Uh, and then they were gone. And so I'm not to say that that's going to happen to Putin, but I, I just would say that, um, that uh, uh, you know, um, that there is say, a kind of precedent for that. We could also, of course, as uh, Rich said, look at the Soviet Union example itself. Mikhail Gorbachev is the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Um, that's a pretty powerful position that he held even during this period of reform in the 1980s, and he's effectively overthrown. I mean, there's a period of a coup, uh, the, the coup, of course, in August of 91, and then ultimately Gorbachev chooses to dissolve the Soviet Union but it leads to the end of his rule in a way that was wholly unexpected. And so, um, so again, I agree with Rich. I think all of those assessments are, are accurate. I would just sort of caution that uh, history has exceptions. I, I, would, I would like to be optimistic about this. Um, from what I've heard from other scholars, and I just have sort of minimal contact with scholars inside uh, Russia, I mean, and as, as I think uh, was discussed at the beginning of the panel, there's just draconian penalties against protesters. Um, one scholar that I know, uh, just replying on a lift serve, was talking, saying something about the war, and then she put at the end, P.S., just by putting the word war, I could be subject mm -hmm. to going to prison mm -hmm. for 15 years. So Putin is aware that people would very much like to, or that some people would very much like to rise up and get them out. But uh, what people are looking to do right now, I think, is flee more than anything else. Yeah. That's just my impression. I don't know. It's, it strikes me as ironic, uh, as was mentioned, I think, by Dr. Baldy, that perhaps President Putin has acted as he has in Ukraine because he feared uh, the fate of deposed leaders in Libya and Egypt. Uh, perhaps Iraq. Um, I, I, just, I wonder if that may prove to be a, a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Robinette. Another uh, question. Alyssa from Political Science 400 
asked, why does the Ukrainian president keep asking for a no-fly zone when he knows America won't get involved in that? The question is, why does uh, the president of the Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, ask for a no-fly zone? Uh, I'm not sure that he has raised it lately, but he has in the past uh, on the assumption that the United States will not go that route. Well, you know, I can't, I can't speak to the, the issue of whether he really thinks he's, he's going to, or uh, that the United States and NATO is going to enforce a no-fly zone, whether he, he thinks that's a possibility. I, I'm not sure I can comment on that, but I, I would say that uh, I suspect the people of Ukraine would want him to be asking for these things. And that from the perspective of domestic politics inside Ukraine, um, for him to ask for anything less than uh, full-scale support, military, diplomatic, uh, sanctions, economic from, uh, from, from the West, from the United States, from uh, countries around the world, um, you know, I think that would be seen as a, a not be seen favorably by the Ukrainian population. And Zelensky, uh, you know, who has proved himself uh, adept in ways that, I, again, I think people just did not anticipate two months ago, uh, recognizes that. So uh, let me actually, uh, again, shift gears just to cover some of these questions. Uh, yesterday, China was the only United Nations Security Council member to support a Russian resolution at the UN acknowledging a humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, but uh, not surprisingly not acknowledging that Russia had caused that humanitarian crisis. Uh, what, what is to stop, what is, as, as one questioner put it, what is to stop China or North Korea we learned that the North Koreans have just launched their first intercontinental ballistic missile in the last five years. Uh, what is to stop China or North Korea from taking more concrete expansionist steps at the moment? Or uh, alternatively, is China uh, perhaps getting into um, on thin ice by, as far as we can tell, not certainly not getting in the way of Russian aggression in Ukraine. Well, I, I mean that's sort of the sort of the purpose, the additional purpose of all of the actions that that NATO and the Western powers are taking, is to try and, and conclusively demonstrate that this sort sort of aggressive behavior won't be rewarded. Um, I I think it's a little far fetched to in, in imagine North Korea as an expansionist state insofar is, you know, shooting off inter intercontinental ballistic missiles for North Korea has often been a cry for help since they can't feed themselves most years. Um, in terms of China, I, I think it's kind of instructive uh, that, that the Chinese government is trying to determine exactly how far the West is willing to go to support the Ukraine, I would, I would surmise. Right. That, you know, the Chinese government, Current, the current regime in particular has made it abundantly clear that they would like to end the functional independence of Taiwan if possible, um, but they do not necessarily want to pay a heavy price for it. So th this, this is sort of the, sort of the underlying, underlying uh, background noise that, that, that is going on in Asia because the Chinese have been engaging in expansionist behaviors. They've been building artificial islands out in the South China Sea. They've been militarizing those islands in, in order to interfere with the, the sea traffic of Taiwan and Vietnam and et cetera. So it's, it's just a matter of how far can they go without having to pay an actual price for it. Question from the audience in the theater. Go ahead, yes sir.
and just see the real big shift of the mainstream of the GOP in this country, and seeing that just all of these dynamics that we're experiencing are going to be going on long term, it seems. What do you think might happen if, in American politics, we end up with a GOP Congress and a GOP presidency in 2024? Yeah, I'm struck by the, um, when new, just total, going way back in history, but when the Continental Congress received word that King George had declared martial law in the colonies, uh, Samuel Adams reportedly rose up and said, God damn the King of Great Britain. And uh, Ben Franklin said, God bless the King of Great Britain because he has done nothing, he has done something that we could never do ourselves, which is to ally, we, we're all together now, we're all united. Um, so it's interesting how the, how the rhetoric has moved towards the middle in our national, uh, our, our, our national politics, uh, away, certainly away from the, the margins on the, on the left and the right in, the, in this context of the Ukrainian crisis. The question is, what does, uh, the, what does the panel um, think Again, projecting into the, the near political future for terms of, in terms of the midterm elections later this year or even into 2024. And if you can imagine it, uh, how might a Republican-dominated federal government address the Ukrainian situation, relationship with Eastern Europe at that point to the, to the extent you can imagine what it would be like? Um, so I guess I would say, you know, a lot of uh, unknowns even in that, in that question as you've defined it, you know, there are, appear to be some wings within the Republican Party uh, on this issue. Um, and so it sort of depend, I think, on what, what wing is triumphant, particularly at the presidential level. Um, you know, um, I, I, I could see, so there was talk uh, when Donald Trump was president, so John Bolton, his former national security advisor, has said uh, in, in the time since Trump left, left office that, that Trump had expressed an interest in, in the United States um, leaving NATO or maybe um, stepping back you know, uh, from NATO in some large way uh, during his second term. And so obviously, if, if, the, if the president is pursuing that kind of uh, approach, if that's either Trump or, again, someone maybe from that kind of wing or orientation within the party is victorious in 2024, then, you know, then I think it becomes uh, a big question as to what the United States, how the United States would respond to, uh, to a conflict in Ukraine. And I have to say, um, you know, what we're seeing right now in Ukraine is something that looks like it's moving towards a kind of stalemate situation. And so um, I don't think, I certainly hope it's not, but I, I don't think that it's unreasonable to, to look at this conflict as, as a long-term conflict, potentially, mm -hmm. that may still be an active one by the time we get there. So I think it's an important question, um, but I think there's still sort of a lot of unknowns in there that are tied to American domestic politics and maybe sort of internal party politics uh, among Republicans. Sort of, sort of follow on that. I mean, that that is that is going to be tough to project unless you know exactly what the situation is on the ground in the Ukraine. Um, if 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 you this becomes a long term stalemate, then um, you're going to see probably some significant in fighting in the Republican Party, and it's not entirely clear who emerges victorious. If, however, this this situation is still not in place after after the midterm elections, then I I, I fear that it's going to be a rush to the extremes to avoid to okay this problem solved and we can ignore it and, and move on. It's 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 really going to be tough tough to prognosticate until you know where the situation in the Ukraine lies. One other thing to, to think about is that Putin, for a while, has really been making a play to gain the sympathies of the religious right, um, depicting uh, 
non-Christians in general or the West in general as decadent, uh, especially on issues related to homosexuality, extremely, extremely conservative on those issues. And so we have some members of the Republican Party who kind of like that approach to talking about the decadent West and looking at Russia as sort of an appealing option. Now, I feel like in the last few weeks, that's faded out as uh, Zelensky gets a lot of um, popular support, as Ukraine gets a lot of popular support. But I think Greg's right that this may be a long haul and that Putin is likely to put out those kinds of feelers and appeals again um, to try to make Russia look like uh, the Christian nation that he wants people to think it is. So. And finally, the Putin has expended a tremendous amount of effort and, and finance to undermine democracy as a whole globally. Uh, be, even prior to, to the, the Manafort connection and, and the Trump campaign, Putin has been engaging in this kind of behavior in the Ukraine for, for two decades and also in Western Europe and Southern Europe. And, and the, the idea is to demonstrate, to try and demonstrate, that democracies are weak and democracy is a mistake and that, that democracy is fragile. That's the ultimate goal in, in electing people who are more willing to behave in an authoritarian manner is to say, see, just, and this has been true, again, from this former KGB agent th throughout the period of the Soviet Union as well is to say, see, these, these people are just soft and weak and, and appealing to democracy is a mistake. You should just do what you're told. We have uh, come to the end of this event. Uh, I'm sure that the discussion could carry on much longer and I'm sure it will in, uh, in Macomb and, in, and elsewhere in communities just like ours. I do urge you to remain informed, try to get information, try to get reliable information. If you read something that doesn't quite make sense, try to corroborate it. As they say, if you hear horse, if you hear hooves in the night, it's probably horses and not zebras. I'll explain that um, if you'd like for me to. Uh, there are uh, um, many, many refugees in Ukraine, as you know. One, we asked, uh, sources say that one half of Ukraine's 7.5 million children have been displaced. There was a question about how to support uh, the, the, the relief in Ukraine, and um, there's obviously lots of information on the internet. The International Red Cross uh, and NGO Save the Children both have websites with dedicated um, collection efforts for the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, there's also the website of the Ukrainian consulate in Chicago, which has other information about how to support uh, the Ukrainian people and refugees displaced uh, there um, and in Eastern Europe. Uh, thanks again to Jeremy Robinette for organizing this event, and my hearty thanks to the panelists for sharing their perspectives on this event. Um, thanks, everybody, for participating. Uh, please uh, join me, as I'm sure you will, in uh, a prayer for peace and for the outbreak of peace in this region and a quick and um, uh, a stable uh, de-escalation of violence in the region. Thank you very much.